So now to walk through a few of Maholi Naj's um, notable works. Um, not all photographic, but I thought uh, I thought it's good to go over him in a little more detail here. <clears throat> Since he is making so many connections to sort of art and technology, this might be useful for your final projects uh, to think about that relationship. So these are his telephone pictures from 1923. I do have them trying to show you the appropriate scale of EM1, EM2, and EM3. They are, as you can see, uh, basically identical in terms of the way that they're laid out and the composition, but they're obviously different in terms of scale, right? One is quite small, one is kind of medium sized, and one is one is larger. Um, and these, uh, you know, again, fitting the kind of proto conceptual model um, of uh, of the artists detached from their work, right? Were uh, made by Maholi Naj. Uh, or not made by Maholi Naj, I, would, I guess you would say they were dictated by Maholi Naj over the phone. So what he did is he laid out a, a grid. You can see a grid here. Uh, if you can read this or if you Google this and look for it, you can see the sort of exact construction of, uh, of, how, many, uh, of how many, let's call them pixels or dots, uh, that this takes up going down, how, how wide it goes tall. Uh, same with here, same with here, same with this. So all of this is described and fit onto a grid. And of course, a grid can be adaptable, right? This can be any size, depending on uh, on you how you you know how you want to spread it out. So that's what uh, Maholi Naj did. He created this grid, um, and he dictated this over the phone to an engineer. And the engineer is the one who actually like drew this or or painted it or put it together, right? So Maholi Naj is credited as the artist, uh, although he did not put his hand to this. So there is a, a sort of relationship or connection between the hand of the artist that's becoming detached here because of technology, right? That the technology itself is making things about the mechanical apparatus. It's making it about light. It's making it about something else other than the artist's hand. Uh, and this is a, a, in strong contrast to the way that art had sort of been conceived of prior to the 20th century, uh, really, or at least the mid 19th century with the emergence of photography. Uh, and of course you saw this sort of take on the artist's hand as well in his uh, in his photogram from 1926. Now this might not be the most obvious reading. Of course, he's laying this on top, laying his hand on top, laying the spatula on top of uh, paper and uh, allowing this to sort of create the photograph, right? A direct imprint of the objects onto the photo. Uh, but the fact that he's using his hand here, again, the presence of the artist's hand, I think is significant. When you see that, I think it does signal, or at least point to something that's generally absent from this kind of uh, from this kind of work. This is a direct imprint from the sun. The artist's hand might set up the objects, but it doesn't do anything in the way that it does when you uh, are a sculptor or a ceramicist or uh, or a painter. The hand is again disconnected from these things, uh, and disconnected because of technology. Uh, but at the same time, right, you have him playing on the artist's hand here, making it the kind of central or, or most dominant or at least largest image uh, in here um, to sort of speak to uh, how the artist's hand is being uh, either removed or if not removed, at least changed and modified um, by, uh, by new technologies. Um, and he that he does this through photographic practice as well as others, I think is, uh, is extremely significant and, and points to his, uh, his sort of larger importance um, in the 20th century. And of course, I also uh, misspoke here, so let me correct myself. Um, what we're actually seeing here, right, is the artist hand next to, I mean, what is this? I think I, I just called it a spatula because it looks like a spatula, but you can see the little dusty edges here. This is a paintbrush, right? This is Maholi Naj putting his hand and a paintbrush onto photographic paper and exposing the composition to light. So the brush, right, is a, uh, the brush is in some ways holding the hand here, I think, uh, because this is so bright, uh, you see how uh, the sort of shape of the hand here, right? This, uh, there seems to be a different kind of orientation, a different kind of relationship between the hand and the tool um, where, where the paintbrush is no longer the main means for making a picture, uh, but instead the result of an automatic process, right, of photochemical, operation on the paper. 
So it's this kind of relationship that Maholi Naj is really uh, thinking through here, even when he does sort of straightforward images. If you call this straightforward, climbing the mast from 1928, one of his great images that's used uh, by obviously here, right? We're way past the daguerreotype using what has to be a very small, uh, almost um, handheld mini camera with a fast shutter speed um, to capture or, or to see this person as they're walking up this strange diagonal onto the mast um, onto the mast of a ship. You also get the sense here of uh, of the blurring of the figure with the surroundings um, that uh, that there's a connection uh, between uh, between man and the environment. Um, and uh, and the world around them, right? Even as that you know they're using the ship, a sort of old technology, uh, but the new technology, right? The camera is what captures it in a new way that allows us to see the world anew, even when it's something maybe familiar or not familiar here, right? And this strong diagonal uh, composition has made this one of Maholi Naj's sort of most celebrated um, photographs. But for the purposes of our class, I suppose, uh, maybe the most interesting piece uh, is Maholi Naj's light space modulator. Now, uh, the video that I showed you from the Harvard Art Museum shows this in motion, but it doesn't necessarily show it in, uh, in the sort of darkened room space that Maholi Naj is imagining. Um, here, right, uh, he's creating this, what he calls a light prop uh, or the light space modulator. Uh, and you see right in there, right, the light space, that's, what's ma that's what matters, moving light through time and how it's connected to an environment around it. So you have a connection here, obviously, to, uh, to a mechanical uh, sculpture that's being made with, uh, with the advent of new technologies. This is a sculptural object placed uh, in the center of a room, maybe on a pedestal like, uh, like this one here. Um, but it's also being used almost for, to create like an installation environment uh, of projected light onto a wall, right? Um, so I think there is a, certainly a cinematic uh, connection here in the way that he's thinking about light moving through this device, changing the color and shape of the wall, changing the color and shape of the entire building, um, and that this is really navigating light as a material light as the material object that's going to take up space even while he has something that is mechanical and sculptural at the same time there is a sense of uh, of projection um, so if not necessarily a photography at least of using that that light space and of using light as that tactile material to bend and shape our environment uh, and he is thinking about this on a large scale um, he has this uh, uncompleted project called the Room of Our Time um, that was supposed to have a number of uh, light space modulators in them. He had this design for this uh, for this to be set up, uh, and then different images, photographs on the wall. Which, if you can imagine, something like this with this red and green light rotating around the room would absolutely alter all of the photographs and all of our sense of depth and space and color and time all through this rotation of light, this projection of light onto the walls. So here we really get a sense of what I led uh, the, the first week of class when I talked about intermedia, um, a sort of connection between different media practices to be consumed uh, or to be uh, connected across, uh, across different modalities. Here you have a connection of photography to sculpture, to, uh, to film, to installation, all, uh, all in one space. And this is something that maybe not be not be huge in the 1930s, but certainly in the 1960s, and part of what we'll look at um, next week, this idea of expanded cinema takes uh, takes a lot of this up. And this is an example of Stan Vanderbeek's movie drone from 1963. You can see on my cursor, you have a number of images projected onto the wall. This ha often had multiple. Um, film projectors, slide projectors, other photos and drawings hung on the wall. Live music would be played down here. You would have stroboscopic lights projecting around the room. So you get this full-on environmental installation um, that really is 
being drawn out of what Maholi Naj is setting up for us in the in the 1930s, uh, 1920s and 30s at the Bauhaus. So when you think of a contemporary light show um, or even like a concert that, you know, with a, a big budget with with wall projections and sculptural projections, light projections, um, it really is uh, one of the founding one of the founding figures of that kind of thinking, that kind of intermedial thinking uh, is Maholi Naj at the Bauhaus with uh, in particular with his um, light space modulator.